At 8.45, we'll begin meeting number four of the Standing Committee on Justice and Human Rights. Okay, thanks. And uh, today, pursuant to the order of reference of Wednesday, September the 28th, 2011, Bill C-10, an act to, en to enact the Justice for Victims of Terrorism Act and to amend the State Immunity Act, the Criminal Code, the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, the Corrections and Conditional Release Act, the Youth Criminal Justice Act, the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, and other acts. And uh, today, appearing with... Uh, the Honorable Rob Nicholson, Minister of Justice, and the Honorable Vic Tays, Minister of Public Safety, along with their officials and uh, uh, ministers. The uh, agreed process today has been that each uh, of you will be given five minutes as an opening address, and uh, then we'll go to questions from the panel. Well, thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here with Catherine Kane from the Department of Justice, who I think you know uh, very well from all the different pieces of legislation that we've had. Uh, je suis heureux de m'adresser aux membres du comité au début de votre examinant du projet de loi C-10, la loi sur la sécurité des rues et des communautés. The Safe Streets and Communities Act fulfills our government's commitment to quickly reintroduce legislation to combat crime and stand up for victims and law-abiding Canadians. Canadians, as you know, gave us a strong mandate to bring forward these measures that will better protect society and ensure that criminals are held accountable for their actions. C-10 combines nine bills that were not passed in the previous parliament all of which have been debated in both the House, and, House of Commons and or the Senate. I'm pleased today to be joined by my colleague, uh, the Honorable Vic Tays, Minister of Safety, to outline the important measures contained in, in this bill. I will speak to parts two and four of the bill. Minister Tays will speak to parts one and three of the bill. As I previously stated, while the text of C-10 is certainly longer than most, the fact remains that these reforms have been debated, studied, and in some cases passed by at least one chamber. I encourage all members of the committee to consult the parliamentary record that exists for all of these previous bills. I'll take a few moments to highlight uh, a number of the measures. Part two of the Safe Streets and Communities Act includes Bill former bill S-10, the Penalties for Organized Drug Crime Act. As you may know, it proposes to amend the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act to impose mandatory penalties for the offenses of production, trafficking, or possession for the purposes of trafficking or importing, and exporting or possession for the purposes of exporting a Schedule I drug such as heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine, and Schedule II drugs such as marijuana. As you may be aware, this is the fourth time that this bill has been introduced. They have passed, been passed by both chambers, but uh, obviously never by both in the same session. This bill is in exactly the same form as, as it was in the dissolution of the last parliament. Part two also includes reforms previously proposed by the former Bill C-16, the Ending House Arrest for Property and Other Serious Crimes by Serious and Violent Offenders Act. These reforms would explicitly state that a conditional sentence is never available for offenses punishable by a maximum of 14 years or life, for offenses prosecuted by indictment and punishable by a maximum penalty of 10 years that result in bodily harm involve the import-export, trafficking, and production of drugs, or involve the use of a weapon, or for the listed property and violent offenses punishable by 10 years and prosecuted by indictments such as criminal harassment, trafficking in persons, and theft over $5,000. Now, this is the third time these reforms have been introduced by our government, and on each prior occasion, they received second reading approval in principle and scope. I note that there have been a few technical changes made to the list of excluded offenses punishable by a maximum of 10 years. These include changes to include the recently enacted new offense of motor vehicle theft, 
to coordinate the proposed imposition of a mandatory sentence of imprisonment in Section 172.1, the luring of a child with the conditional uh, sentences amendments. Now, the last component of Part 2 are the reforms previously proposed by Bill C-54, Protecting Children from Sexual Predators Act. These reforms seek to consistently and adequately condemn all forms of child sexual abuse through the imposition of new and higher mandatory penalties. They also seek to prevent the commission of sexual offenses against children through the creation of two new offenses. We are also seeking to require the courts to consider imposing conditions to prevent suspected or convicted child sex offenders from engaging in conduct that could facilitate or further a sexual offense against a child. While Bill C-54 had been passed by the House of Commons with an all-party support and it was at third reading debate in the Senate uh, when unfortunately uh, uh, the opposition parties decided to force an election and uh, I was very disappointed that uh, this important bill then died on, on the order paper. But since that time, uh, we've made some changes, as you will see, to increase the, uh, the maximum penalties with a corresponding increase in mandatory minimum sentences to better reflect uh, the nature of the, of the offenses, including making or distributing child pornography or parent or guardian procuring their child for unlawful sexual activity. And these ch changes are consistent with the government's uh, objectives for the former bill C-54 as well as the two new sexual offenses proposed by this part would be uh, added to sec Schedule One of the Criminal Records Act to ensure that persons convicted of either offense are subject to the same period of ineligibility for a record suspension, uh, currently referred to as a pardon, as for other sexual, child sexual offenses. Finally, Part Four of the bill proposes to amend the Youth Criminal Justice Act to strengthen the way the system deals with violent and repeat young offenders. Now, these measures include highlighting protection of the public as a principle, making it easier to detain youth charged with serious offenses pending trial, ensuring that prosecutors consider seeking adult sentences for the most serious offenses, requiring police to keep records of extrajudicial measures, and requiring courts to lift the publication ban of the names of young offenders convicted of violent offenses when a youth uh, sentence is given. These reforms were previously proposed in uh, Bill C-4, Sebastian's Law. The former C-4 was extensively studied by the House of Commons Standing Committee uh, through 16 meetings at the dissolution of the previous Parliament. The bill includes changes to address concerns that have been highlighted by the provinces regarding the pretrial adult sentencing and deferred custody provisions in the bill. For example, changes to the pretrial detention provisions respond to the province's requests for more flexibility to detain, a youth, uh, to detain youth who are spiraling out of control and pose a risk to the public of committing a serious offense if released, even if they have not been charged initially with a serious offense. The test for pretrial detention would now be self-contained in the Act without requiring reference to the criminal code, which is uh, currently the case. Other technical changes include removing the, the proposed test for an adult sentence and deferred custody and supervision orders and returning to the current law's approach. For example, the former bill referred to the standard of a, beyond a reasonable doubt, while some provinces found, which some provinces found more difficult to meet. Uh, that has been removed and continues the current approach of leaving it up to the courts to determine the appropriate standard of proof. Under C-10, Deferred custody and supervision orders will not be available if the youth has been found guilty of an offense involving or attempting to cause serious bodily harm. In closing, uh, most of C-10's re reforms have been debated, studied, and some even passed. The few new elements I've outlined are consistent with the objectives of the former bills as originally introduced or need make some needed technical changes. Uh, I urge the committee to work with the government to support the timely enactment of the Safe Streets and Communities Act. And we are taking action to protect families, stand up for victims, and hold individuals accountable. 
Canadians can count on our government's commitment to fulfill its promise to pass this comprehensive bill uh, within the first 100 sitting days of this Parliament. Thank you very much. I would ask Minister Tays now to deliver his remarks. Thank you, <clears throat> Minister Nicholson and uh, Mr. Chairman, honourable members of the committee. I would like to thank you for the invitation to be here and for the opportunity to speak with you on Bill C-10, the Safe Streets and Communities Act. With me is uh, Mary Campbell of the Department. Uh, today I would like to focus my opening remarks on components of the legislation before you which will or which do pertain to the public safety portfolio. These provisions will eliminate pardons for serious crimes, it will increase offender accountability and support victims of crime, it will provide justice for victims of terrorism and ensure public safety is the paramount consideration when considering offenders' requests for an international transfer. Last year, our government passed legislation to initiate reforms to the pardon system, and Bill C-10 contains further measures to eliminate pardons for serious crimes, including sexual offenses against minors. Bill C-10 will also replace the word pardon with the more appropriate term record suspension and further stipulates that an individual convicted of more than three indictable offenses who has received a sentence of two years or more for each will be ineligible for a record suspension. These reforms to the pardons system will also apply to the equivalent service offenses under the National Defense Act. Bill C-10 would also enshrine in law a victim's right to attend and make statements at parole hearings. In addition, it would enable victims to request additional information about an offender, including the reason for transfer or te temporary absence and an offender's participation in program activities. This bill proposes that when offenders withdraw 14 days or less before the date of a hearing, the parole board may proceed as scheduled. Victims would also have the right to ask why the offender has waived a parole hearing. These measures would go a long way to preserving the peace of mind of victims. Bill C-10 would also modernize the system of discipline in federal penitentiary. It will address disrespectful, intimidating, or assaultive behavior, including throwing of bodily substances. It would also restrict visits for inmates who have been segregated for serious disciplinary offenses. Our frontline officers have asked for these measures, and we are proud to deliver. This government is committed to transforming our correction system to ensure that it actually corrects. We have already taken major steps to address the recommendations contained in the roadmap to public safety. The bill before the House continues this vital work. Canadians deserve to feel safe in their homes. Victims deserve to be treated with more respect. Corrections officers need the tools to do their jobs, and offenders must be prepared to take more responsibility for their conduct and pay the price if they break the rules. C-10 will do all that. Bill C-10 will do a lot for victims, including victims of terrorist attacks. Specifically, Bill C-10 will allow victims of terrorism to sue in a Canadian court perpetrators of terrorist acts and their supporters if the victims can demonstrate a real and substantial connection between their actions and Canada. In addition, an action could be brought against individuals, entities, or listed states which provided support to a listed entity. These provisions are retroactive to January 1, 1985, in order to allow victims of terrorism to seek redress for loss and damage that occurred as a result of a terrorist act committed anywhere in the world on or after that date. Finally, Bill C-10 will further strengthen our efforts to build safer streets and communities for all Canadians by amending the International Transfer of Offenders Act. These amendments would ensure in law a number of additional key factors that may be taken into account in decisions respecting whether or not an offender serving a sentence overseas or indeed south of the line should be granted a transfer back to Canada. 
This would include consideration of the safety of any person in Canada who is a victim or a member of the offender's family. Another consideration would be whether the offender would continue to engage in criminal activities following the transfer or endanger the safety of a child, particular in cases of offenders who have been convicted of sexual abuse. Our government believes that protection of society must be the paramount concern of our justice system and with the Safe Streets and Communities Act, we are ensuring that law-abiding citizens and families are protected, criminals are held accountable, victims are heard and respected, and we have a correction system that actually corrects. As you know, Canadians gave our government a strong mandate to keep our streets and communities safe. With the Safe Streets and Communities Act, that is exactly what we are continuing to do. Thank you, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you may wish to direct to me. Thank you. Thank you uh, to both the ministers. And now we begin the, uh, the rounds. There are five-minute rounds. Five minutes is the question and the answer. And uh, I will cut it off uh, in mid-word, if necessary, to be fair to everybody. So first uh, is uh, Mr. Gauguin from Thank the Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question would be to Minister Nicholson. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. My mistake. Mr. Comartin is first from the NDP. I have to say, Mr. Chair, I know your government wants to rush this thing through, but we do have to follow the rules. And I get to go first, or my side gets to go first. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ministers, both for being here. I'd like to start, Mr. Nicholson, with you, if I could. Um, you have a uh, study which you refer to constantly. Um, on cost of crime in this country. Uh, my first question is, was that commissioned by your department? I believe it was. The Department of Justice put that out. Okay, and you're referring to the one that the cost of crime is at approximately $99 billion. It's a 2008 uh, Department of Justice and indicating most of the costs are borne by victims. Um, the, uh, that was commissioned back in 2008? Yes, it is. All right. And uh, the, per the author of this it's done internally by the Department of Justice. Okay. And so the author is a, a member of the Department of Justice? Department of Justice. Staff. Um, did you at the same time commission a, a study on the costs of any of these uh, any of these bills as they were then individual bills, and in particular the drug bill? Um, again, we consult uh, on a regular basis uh, with uh, our colleagues. The, the Department of Justice, as you know, for the uh, works uh, with our provincial counterparts, and uh, we have had discussions, of course, uh, with uh, public safety because um, ultimately, if an individual is being detained uh, because they are a drug dealer, um, these uh, can increase the costs uh, to the correctional system. Do you have any figures as to how much? Just the drug part of this bill, the, the, increase, the, bill. the increased incarceration uh, under the drug bill is it going from, to cost the federal by treasury. All means, uh, I, that uh, approximately 67, about $68 million over the next five years would be, uh, would be the cost of that particular section of the bill. Is there an actual study, an analysis, a written analysis of that figure, for that figure? Yeah, it was uh, again disclosed as part of the the Bryson motion earlier in the spring, and uh, again this uh, results from our consultations, uh, you know, within the department and uh, the public safety department. Uh, has there been any similar analysis been done as to the cost, again, just of the drug part of this bill, to the uh, provincial and territorial governments? Uh, not undertaken by the Department of Justice, and uh, but uh, I've had discussions, of course, with over the years, so they're well aware of all the provisions uh, uh, of this. And um, again, uh, I very much appreciate the support that we have received from my provincial counterparts moving forward on this. But the question, Mr. Uh, Nicholson, was: Has an actual analysis been done of what it is going to cost the provinces and territories? Uh, the, the analysis that we have is uh, what it's going to cost the federal government. The federal government prosecutes, for the most part, uh, uh, the offenses contained therein, and uh, if, if you're detained, as you know, for uh, two years or more, you're detained within federal facilities, but uh, we don't have a breakdown of what the possible costs are for each province or territory. Has an analysis been made of the uh, proportion of people convicted, uh, newly convicted under the drug part of this bill 
um, who will go into <laughs> provincial institutions as opposed to federal institutions? No, you can see the mandatory minimums are, will push uh, more people uh, into the federal system, and uh, but so you're right, it'll be a reduction. Uh, in, that, in that sense, that uh, the people who uh, get increased penalties are more likely to end up in federal institutions. So you're quite correct. Uh, it, it might ease some of the pressure on provincial facilities. I don't want to leave the impression that I'm agreeing with that, uh, that comment. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. I thought that Mr. was the direction Minister, you were going. Uh, my, I, my analysis is just uh, the opposite. Oh, that we're see. going to well, see a huge enough. increase in the number of uh, prisoners at the provincial institution because of the two years less. Uh, well, we'll have to take some comfort. We're getting the right ones in there. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Comhartin. Uh, so. Again, I'll disagree with you on that. <laughs> uh, if I can switch to, I'm sorry, uh, just one more question with regards to provincial costs. Are you aware of any of the provinces doing, having done an analysis, again, uh, just on the drug part of the bill, as to how much it's going to cost them individually? Uh, I don't know any specifically. I noticed just recently the uh, Saskatchewan uh, Minister of uh, Corrections indicating that it's very difficult to try and predict uh, uh, you know, the increased costs or costs into the future and trying to determine what people's behavior would be, I guess, uh, uh, again, they can speak for themselves, but uh, it's very difficult. If a provincial government was going to do that analysis and required information and data from uh, yourself or Minister Taves' department, would you be willing to give them that information? We try to help them in every possible way, uh, um, Mr. Comartin, and uh, as I say, with the drug bill, uh, this is the fourth time we've introduced it, and quite frankly, I've, uh, I've had discussions going back now almost five years with uh, my provincial counterparts, so they're, they're well aware of the implications, and uh, again, I'm very grateful for, for all the support that they've given over the years. Mr. Comartin. Now, Mr. Gauguin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. A uh, question to Mr. Er, Minister Nicholson, and uh, where he's concise in his answers, I'll probably pass the baton to my friend, Mr. Seabach. I'm concise in my answer. I said, no, you will, you, you're most usually concise. Oh, oh okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, I just wanted a clarification on that. Uh, Minister, the opposition parties and the media have stated that this government is going after individuals who are growing the six plants in their homes for personal use. Is, is this the intent of BC, Bill C-10? Is this what B, Bill C-10 does? Is this uh, bill imposing mandatory minimum penalties for the individual who is recreationally using drugs uh, or the addict that can't wean himself off drugs? No, I, I appreciate our, our critics uh, want to spin this in a way to, to give that impression, and uh, yeah, and you'll hear this from people who don't want us to go after people who are uh, in the business of trafficking. But the bill is very clear uh, that if you are in the in the grow up business and you have between six and 199 plants, it uh, you will come within the provisions of this if you're in the business of trafficking. And again, uh, our critics, uh, for whatever reason, I suppose they can explain that themselves, uh, generally forget to mention that. Uh, but that is an essential element of the offense. And uh, again, the whole problem with uh, grow ops, uh, I hear about this everywhere I go in the country. I hear about it from law enforcement agencies. I hear it from it from firefighters, uh, that it is a growing health and safety problem. And uh, again, uh, I've indicated to them that uh, we are doing our very best to move forward in this direction to send out the right message that uh, this kind of activity for the purposes of trafficking is, is not tolerable. That being said, for the individual who has either unfortunately become addicted or is experimenting, I mean, through the National Anti-Drug Strategy, we try and get the message out to encourage people not to get involved with this kind of activity. And uh, certainly we want to help those individuals who have unfortunately become uh, addicted. Uh, that being said, this bill is very specific. It goes after those individuals who are in the business of uh, selling and distributing and, and producing drugs, it takes aim at organized crime, because that's who uh, law enforcement agencies tell me. These are the people bringing drugs into this country. It's, uh, you know, not some uh, individual acting on his own. They tell me it's organized crime that moves drugs in and out of Canada. And so this bill is very specifically and it targets uh, those individuals. Thank you, Mr. I'll pass the baton with your permission to uh, Mr. Seabach. Sure, my time. A little over two minutes. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Nicholson, one of the things that I've noticed when I meet and talk with my constituents uh, is that uh, they seem frustrated with the system. 
uh, they've been frustrated that violent offenders are receiving sentences like house arrest. I'm wondering if you could perhaps, uh, you know, expand upon what you've said earlier, how this is going to help restore faith in the justice system and uh, ensure that violent criminal offenders are not uh, receiving conditional sentences and are back in our communities. Well, uh, we've had uh, at this point in time a, a fairly long history with uh, containing the use of conditional sentences or very often refer, referred to as house arrest. In fact, my colleague introduced the first bill on behalf of this government to uh, limit, uh, limit house arrest. And uh, I always remember the, the quip he, he had that uh, if somebody uh, sets fire to your house, uh, he shouldn't be qualified to go home to his house after uh, he or she has been uh, convicted. So uh, I think you said that, didn't you, uh, Public Safety Minister? Uh, in any case, as you can see by the bill before you, the bill is very specific, so that the, the most serious offenses within the, the criminal code, uh, you will not be eligible to go home uh, afterwards, that uh, there is and will continue, of course, to be serious consequences. And uh, again, uh, I, I think this helps people's confidence in the criminal justice system. We all have uh, a stake in that and in seeing that people have confidence in our justice system and in our political uh, system and so uh, I believe this is a step in the the right direction and again uh, the the changes that we have uh, made and are proposing uh, to to clarify uh, the provisions with respect to conditional sentencing are contained in this bill and uh, they're an important component of what we're proposing we got uh, 10 seconds thank you. I, uh, <laughs> thank you very much okay thank you <laughs> mr. Kotler Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also want to uh, welcome our <coughs> two witnesses uh, this morning. Uh, both of you have mentioned that Canadians have given us a strong mandate for safe streets and communities. Uh, that is correct. But Canadians give every government a strong mandate for safe streets and communities. And indeed, governments have an obligation uh, to protect their citizens. So the question really then becomes, how do governments go about doing this? Now, even before this legislation was tabled, we had a serious problem with prison overcrowding. And indeed, in some provinces, it had reached uh, 200 uh, percent. Recently, the United States uh, Supreme Court said that a threshold of 137 percent above that in prison overcrowding uh, would lead to cruel and unusual uh, punishment. How do you address this question? Because if we had a serious problem before this legislation, that problem may be exacerbated by the legislation, and how will the provinces on whom this is going to be offloaded be able to deal with this? Well, uh, maybe I can uh, uh, try to answer part of that question. Of course, the American system is very, very different. Uh, the federal system in the United States doesn't have even a parole system, and so there is no mechanism to relieve any pressure through that, so the courts had to make a very uh, arbitrary decision in that respect. I believe in the federal system in the United States, uh, you serve 85 percent of your sentence and you get 15 percent off for good behavior, but there's no parole system. The, um, the, the idea that somehow, uh, and I can speak from the federal uh, point of view, that uh, the legislation that we brought forward is causing overcrowding, I think is mistaken. Um, at the beginning of, of uh, 2010, uh, we had approximately 14,000 uh, prisoners in the federal system with a capacity of 15,000. My staff uh, advised me that, uh, or I should say officials advised me, that there would be an increase of, of uh, prisoners to 16,200 by September of this year. In fact, the number is 14,800. Uh, so they underestimated the amount of prisoners coming into the system or remaining in the system by about two-thirds. Um, at the same time, we authorized the construction of 2,500 units in existing prisons, so new units in existing prisons, to accommodate any, um, any uh, additional um, uh, prisoners that might come. Uh, to date, those have not been constructed and have not... Uh, uh, it's, it hasn't been uh, necessary to utilize them, uh, although I can say that uh, 
uh, the prison officials have to, uh, you know, be creative in terms of moving uh, individuals because of the pressures of gangs and the like. So these 2,500 units that we have authorized that are coming online in the next uh, couple of years will be uh, necessary to ease some of those pressures and also uh, to uh, create flexibility in terms of some of the gang uh, problems that we have inside prisons. Um, Mr. Chairman, for reasons of time, I'm just going to uh, turn to another uh, issue. Uh, and since I'm in dialogue with Mr. Tays, I'll put this question uh, directly uh, to him. Uh, you've referenced an important piece of legislation that has not been uh, taken particular note of uh, in this bill, and I'm referring here uh, to the amendments, proposed amendments respecting the State Immunity Act, which will give Canadians a civil remedy against their foreign terrorist uh, perpetrators. Now, uh, the legislation that you have proposed provides for a listing mechanism. The government, government and council will list the countries against whom such a civil remedy uh, can be invoked. Now, as you know, there have been private members' bills that have offered uh, other uh, approaches uh, as alternatives to a listing uh, mechanism for, I think, some of the reasons you know. But in particular, a, a witness that the government called upon in earlier uh, debates on this matter, Victor Compras from the United States, supported the principle of a civil remedy, as I do, uh, with respect to the listing mechanism, said, and I believe I'm quoting him directly, don't go there, we made a mistake. So my question uh, to you is, um, are you prepared to consider other uh, alternatives, or can you give me the justification um, in that context for the listing mechanism? Well, Ms. Uh, Mr. Cockler, I, I do respect your uh, opinion very much. As a result of our conversation, I spoke with officials and I said, look, is it justified that we look at some alterations here? Uh, the officials uh, basically stated that they believe this was the best way to proceed, but uh, I would encourage you to uh, interview those uh, officials to have that discussion and uh, perhaps, uh, I don't know if there's any flexibility. We've discussed both sides of that issue. Uh, I think we both want exactly the same thing, justice for victims of terrorism, and uh, certainly uh, I, kn I know that uh, I'm willing uh, uh, to consider arguments, but th this is where uh, officials advise us is the best route uh, at this point. Ms. Finley? Thank you, Mr. Chair. My, um, my question is for Minister Nicholson. I believe that all honourable members here wish to do everything possible to protect our children from harm. As a parent myself, uh, it's certainly a, a great fear of mine any time that I hear that a child uh, has been hurt or could be. Children are particularly vulnerable to sexual abuse and exploitation and are, in fact, as I understand it, the majority of victims of all police reported victims of sexual assault in Canada. Uh, children represented 59% of all police reported sexual assault victims, which I believe is about 13,700 children uh, under the age of 18 in 2008 alone. My source for that is uh, StatsCan Centre for Justice Statistics, the Uniform Crime Reporting Survey. Minister, is there a risk that implementing mandatory minimum penalties might result in more plea bargaining. One of the things that you will notice uh, is that the bill is comprehensive in the sense it covers all wide range, a whole range of sexual uh, assaults uh, or offenses uh, against children and it's uh, designed uh, for among other reasons to make sure that an individual that's uh, in the business of molesting children or abusing uh, children uh, does not escape uh, the, the penalties that are there within the, the criminal code. And in addition, it goes beyond the existing offenses because we know that we have to continuously analyze what takes place in this type of activity, and this is why we've included two new offenses. That while it is an offense uh, for an uh, individual to lure a child over the internet to to set that child up to be uh, sexually exploited.
it, uh, it currently is, is not covered in the criminal code where two adults discuss this among themselves on how to do that. So that is one of the changes that, uh, that we have made. The other change that we have made, and again, this is in response to, to problems that we have heard, uh, is that uh, we are making it an offense for an, an somebody to give sexually explicit material to a child for the purpose of grooming that child. Uh, setting that child up in, a, in essence uh, to be sexually molested so that the child thinks that this is somehow um, normal uh, behavior. So uh, again, part of the challenge that we always have in the criminal code is to make sure that it continues to respond to what takes place out there. As you know, this is a, an increasing problem. I hear this in my conversations with uh, attorneys general uh, outside of Canada that the increase in this kind of activity on computers and so our job as legislators is to try and make sure uh, that our legislation is as up to date and covers all uh, as much of this activity as we can possibly get within the criminal code so you'll see it's very wide ranging and comprehensive my colleague has some comments just uh, in respect to the issue of plea bargaining plea bargaining often has a, a bad reputation. Plea bargaining is absolutely essential for the, uh, for the operation of the just justice system. And I say that as a, a Crown attorney, it's the abuse, uh, as a former Crown attorney, it's the abuse of uh, plea bargaining that we have to be mindful of. A, a principled Crown attorney uh, will uh, bargain or make an agreement if he believes that uh, the, the public interest and the interest of justice can be served through another arrangement. And so that's, that's essentially what a plea uh, bargain or a plea arrangement uh, is. Uh, what the, what minim, mandatory minimum sentences do is uh, certainly encourage uh, people to look at their alternatives. But what they also do is once you go to trial and a person is convicted and receives the mandatory minimum, that individual is no longer back out in the street as quickly and then committing more offenses. So uh, uh, some say that it may delay the process because of additional trials. In fact, in the long run, these types of mandatory minimums uh, properly focused on appropriate offenses such as these will in fact lessen the burden on the justice system. 30 seconds, short question, short answer. We, uh, we hear a lot from the opposition about uh, the uh, statistics on crime going down. Uh, is that true when it comes to sexual offenses against children? Minister? No, we might have missed that actually in the discussion, uh, but uh, the, uh, the child pornography, the, 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 the offenses against children actually are incre increasing. Uh, and uh, I hear this in my discussions uh, with my uh, counterparts outside of, of Canada that this becomes increasingly is becoming a, a problem, but uh, a problem is a problem and it's not just a question of uh, uh, statistics. Uh, we, we want to deal uh, with these. I mean, it's the same way with drug, drug crimes. I mean, drug crimes uh, are, are up in Canada, but uh, again, I always say we're not governing on the basis of statistics. I'm not bringing these forward. Um, because of the latest statistics we're becoming, because, because I believe they're the right thing to do to better protect children uh, within the criminal law of this country. We should be making these changes and we should, for instance, bringing in the two new offenses that uh, I just out, outlined for you. I think it's important to do that, but you're quite correct. Uh, the, uh, the incidence of, of these types of crimes is going up. Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I welcome the witnesses and have to, have to excuse me if I jump right to questions because my time is short. Um, I'm mostly interested in questions regarding the uh, Drug and Substances Act, Controlled Drug and Substances Act. Uh, my first question for Mr. Nicholson would be uh, uh, the, the uh, six months for six plants uh, aspect of this bill. I was just wondering uh, in terms of the size of marijuana plant, uh, it says that it's six plants, it doesn't seem to be defined. Are you talking perhaps uh, seedlings would be considered here? Uh, again, uh, we rely on police, and it's a question of fact in each particular particular case. And uh, since you've raised the six plants, uh, it's uh, the individual has to be in the business of trafficking. He's in the business of, of buying and selling these. But uh, again, as you know, when these matters go before court, it's a question of fact in each case. And so, uh, 
But, of course, the police would need some uh, guidance on this. So will there be any guidance they, provided they, to police? They do. They get guidance, as you know, from provincial attorneys general, Crown's attorney. Uh, uh, they're the experts, quite frankly, and uh, I've been very impressed in my meetings with them over the years. On, on the one hand, they tell me what a serious problem this is in terms of health and safety and, and, uh, and how this... Uh, many times provides the currency for other harder, harder drugs. So it is a big problem, and uh, again, we're, we're we're addressing it in this particular piece of legislation. But it, but it is possible that somebody could go to a jail for six months for having six seedlings in a window box. It, it's not just a question. The business he has to be in the business of trafficking in drugs, and, and I appreciate this, and, and I'm the first one, because I, I, I've introduced it four times, I appreciate my critics don't want to talk about that, because, again, that, that kind of hurts the case against getting rid of the whole bill, but that is an essential part of that, and that has to be proven in every case. Well, I'm happy to talk about trafficking, and I was just wondering how exactly you determine Well, if, if you're happy is... to be talking about trafficking, we're on the same page, okay, because that's, that's nice. what we're talking about in this bill here. This is good news. <clears throat> but uh, I would like to know how exactly you determine whether somebody is trafficking six. You seedlings. might get law enforcement agencies, and you can, uh, you know, they can they can tell you the things that they look for. I mean, it's becoming quite sophisticated. Uh, I've uh, when I've had when I've been across the country, I've had these conversations with them, and they tell me, you know, it's even changes within the business. They tell me, for instance, the grow up business uh, many times has moved outside the cities into the country, where they maybe feel they maybe under less uh, scrutiny. So there have been developments in that, but. Uh, uh, when you talk with law enforcement agencies, you'll be, I, I think, very impressed by uh, how sophisticated uh, that they, and how expert they are becoming. I I'd just offer a very practical suggestion if you want to learn a little bit about the law of trafficking, sit in on a provincial court or superior court uh, trial. They'll explain the law quite thoroughly and the c type of considerations that police make uh, in determining it. These, these are very well established principles. We're not changing those principles uh, in, in, in any way. Okay, my second question will be regarding, uh, recently the Supreme Court uh, struck down an attempt to shut Insight, which is a safe injection site in the downtown east side. And I'm wondering, uh, with imposing so many costs on the provinces, because most of these, uh, most of these offenses and mandatory minimums will result in people going to provincial jails, I'm wondering if the government has explored the, uh, the possibility of a, of a charter challenge or a court challenge from the provinces in, uh, in light of this offloading of expenses. Uh, the provinces are very well aware of what we are doing. As I say, it's been at least uh, four years ago that I introduced uh, this bill uh, before Parliament and uh, they uh, have um, underlined uh, to me uh, what a, a problem drug trafficking is uh, you know within uh, within the provinces and uh, and so again uh, they're well aware of this and the components of this bill and as I say this bill is uh, uh, identical to the one that, uh, that died on the order paper and these particular provisions. And so, uh, again, I, I appreciate the support that uh, our provincial colleagues. I mean, it's been very helpful over the years, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, in, in dealing with my provincial counterparts, for like, for instance, getting rid of the two-for-one credit. Uh, they were unanimous on a couple of occasions uh, telling me they want us to move forward because they said that would free up provincial resources, that provincial courts were getting clogged by people who were continuously getting uh, adjournments because they were racking up two-for-one credits. And so, again, we work with them, and they're well aware of this. And, again, I've been very appreciative over the years of their support for our efforts to crack down on drug traffickers and other criminals. Well, it's good we're talking about resources here because uh, some people, since the estimates are not available to us, I've heard that as much as $20 billion is going to be downloaded to, in cost to provinces. Are you not worried about them challenging this constitution? Well, I'd like to see that study. Could you could you table that one before? I would hope I, you I would never, have studies that I, you could I, show us. I don't us. have that one, that's for sure. I mean, we, uh, we look at the costs, and uh, as I say, uh, when I was here in the spring, uh, we gave very detailed, and uh, I, had, I had one question with respect to the drug uh, offenses, and uh, our estimate is that this will uh, cost $67.7 uh, million over five years. And uh, again, these, are, these costs are reasonable, but uh, if you've heard or seen uh, studies that these things are costing $20 billion or $100 billion or whatever, whatever you have, uh, I'd, be oh, I'd be happy to, to trade, trade them. You trade know? Sorry, with time, you. time is thank up, you. Mr. Woodward. No. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you uh, to both of the ministers. Uh, you're both. Uh, very articulate in explaining the provisions of uh, these uh, acts, and uh, 
I want to thank you for that. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, serving on this committee in the last uh, parliament, and uh, I stand to be corrected, but if memory serves me, uh, I think that our committee spent something in the range of 18 meetings simply studying uh, what was then uh, Bill C-4 and uh, regarding uh, young offenders. And uh, we heard from uh, quite a number of witnesses uh, over uh, a great many hours of uh, uh, testimony. And uh, I was sometimes amazed at uh, the things that uh, witnesses came believing about this bill. Uh, for example, they seemed to think that uh, we were taking uh, out of the, uh, what used to be the, uh, or is the Youth Criminal Justice Act, uh, provisions regarding rehabilitation and reintegration and addressing circumstances underlying behavior. And yet, if you look at uh, what we were doing and are still doing, I think uh, all of those things are retained. So my question is for Minister Nicholson. Uh, some of those criticisms were that uh, the bill was focused more on punishing all young offenders rather than rehabilitating them. But my understanding is that that uh, Bill C-4 uh, was responding really uh, and, and targeting and focusing uh, on uh, the 5 percent or so of young offenders who were violent and repeat young <coughs> offenders and who really posed a threat uh, to public safety. It was those, those people, those uh, very, uh, if I may say, small uh, number of uh, young and violent offenders that were being uh, targeted and focused by Bill C-4, uh, and the balance, uh, the, the rehabilitation and so on still remained. And, I want to ask you, uh, Minister Nicholson, if this is the same approach which is uh, being maintained in uh, the new Bill C-10 with respect to young offenders. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Woodworth. I mean, you were very kind in saying we were articulate, but I, I don't know if we could be any more articulate than you just were about the, the provisions of this bill. This was uh, very impressive. and. Uh, um, again, uh, you're very familiar with the, uh, uh, the sections that uh, we are proposing uh, to change. Uh, you're quite correct that the bill uh, focuses on a relatively small number of young uh, per people who are uh, a danger to the public, but a danger to themselves as well. And uh, we have seen uh, reports over the years that uh, focus in on, on individuals who, uh, who need help. Uh, they need uh, some type of uh, intervention and the bill. So the bill is very specific and again, uh, we want to increase people's confidence in the youth criminal justice system. Uh, we want to make sure that those individuals who, as I say, are a danger to the public and a danger to themselves, uh, get the kind of treatment uh, uh, and the, uh, uh, that they need uh, to, to protect themselves and, and the public. And so the bill is very targeted, uh, very specific. And again, uh, we have uh, listened to uh, what uh, our provincial counterparts have said about uh, clarifying uh, certain er areas. And so I would hope that uh, in your uh, study of this over the next, uh, uh, next few days that uh, you will have an opportunity to hear that. But I mean, we're not doing uh, some of the things that uh, people have accused us of in the past. We're not, we don't, uh, we're making sure that uh, there are provisions that uh, young people are not detained or not sentenced uh, in the same facilities um, with adults. Uh, this uh, came up, uh, I think it was two elections ago, uh, from a party that uh, is no longer here. Uh, <laughs> that being said, uh, you know, we, we put some clarification in, and these are very reasonable proposals. And uh, but again, uh, thank you for the the excellent job that you did in articulating the the principles behind it. Thank you, Minister. And I, and I want to say that, uh, in fact, that canard about uh, jailing young people with yeah. adults is still out there. I still I, read it, and I don't know who's promoting it, uh, but I'm very glad that you've made well, the Well, you can be assured that the Minister of Public Safety and I are not doing that. I you understand. Know, we, I'm very we're only saying raise, what's uh, in the bill. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, do I have more time? 30 seconds. Uh, Minister, I just want to say quickly, we had a witness last time, a young man, uh, who actually uh, spent uh, a significant time in jail, came to our committee and confirmed exactly what you said about the benefit to him of uh, having that sentence, and it really set his life on the right track. So thank you very much for that. My pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Woodward. Uh, Ms. Borg. Uh, yes, hi. So my first question is directed to Minister Taves. 
Um, so I have many examples of, of criminals who have committed three minor crimes in a row and have been sentenced for two years of time, but they've actually been able to reform themselves. One particular example um, is, is a young gentleman who's actually been brought into a life of crime by his mother at the age of 11. And uh, he has now reformed his life and is trying to be a carpenter, but he cannot because he cannot get what used to be a pardon, what will be a record suspension. So I was wondering if the minister has considered the social and economic costs um, to uh, this problem of not being able to get employment for these reformed criminals. Well, um, this would be news to me that uh, someone who's been convicted of four indictable offenses, who've re who's received a penitentiary term, a penitentiary term for each of those four indictable offenses, uh, uh, that uh, uh, he has somehow reformed himself and can't get a, a pardon. Um, uh, I would think most Canadians say that once an individual has been convicted of more than three indictable offences to which he or she has been convicted of, a, uh, of the offence and sentenced to a penitentiary term, that that individual should then be uh, provided with a record suspension. There comes a point in time when society simply says, no, that's, that's quite enough. Now, you might be mistaking uh, what happens sometimes with a, a break and enter, for example. Let's say uh, even under this bill, a young person, and this is probably the case in, in the case where you're uh, referring to, uh, a young man has committed, let's say, 20 break and enters and has received three months consecutive on each, uh, and then they do the rounding down or whatever they do, you know, proportionality, and the individuals received three years. None of those offenses would count to the disqualification. None of them. So I'd like to see the particular case that you're referring to, uh, because I, I, I find it surprising that those are minor offenses where a person has been convicted of four offenses for which he has received a penitentiary term on each offense. Je serais contente de vous les donner. Um, aussi, uh, ben, c'est sûr que ben, vous parlez que c'est pas possible qu'une personne puisse se réformer après avoir euh, après avoir commis trois crimes de suite. Mais euh, moi, je pense surtout aux jeunes. Mettons quelqu'un a 20 ans puis trois trois fois deux ans en prison, ils ont 26 ans quand ils sortent. Ils ont toute une vie pour changer leur leur, leur manière. Ils ont toute une vie pour sortir de, de la vie criminelle. Mais avec ces projets de loi, est-ce que est-ce que vous avez considéré que peut-être on est en train de les forcer dans une vie de criminalité? Well, uh, as I said, I'd like to see uh, the examples that you're referring to because uh, um, where an individual has been convicted of more than three indictable offenses for which for which of he has received in a penitentiary term in respect of each one uh, that uh, that individual should be deserving of a record suspension. I, I simply believe that there comes a point in time when society must be protected against that kind uh, of an individual. And I believe we've uh, drawn a very clear line. And uh, I think it's a fair one. Canadians would agree with the position we've taken. Um, ma prochaine question, euh, ça porte sur la tra le transfert inter international des prisonniers. Euh, puis je veux demander au ministre s'il si, euh, est au courant d'une lettre qui a été envoyée par euh, le président américain en janvier 2010. Euh, s'il connaît, s'il l'a vu et si c'est possible de la que le comité ait une copie de cette lettre. Whether a letter has been sent to who and where? Um, um, I'll just say it in English. If, if a letter has been sent um, from, if you if you're aware of a letter that has been sent from the American uh, president to the Canadian, considering the um, criticizing actually the number of people that have been refused to transfer to Canada. Uh, I haven't seen a letter from the president in that respect, but uh, I can advise you this was an issue that I raised with the Homeland Security Secretary Janet Napolitano when I met with her and uh, explained to her that in Canada, uh, for example, people were receiving parole after one-sixth of the time, organized <coughs> criminals, drug traffickers, of course, who receive uh, substantive sentences in the state of Florida, in a federal penitentiary, there would receive a 20-year sentence. Of course, uh, the, the lawyer wants them transferred here to Canada because they become eligible for parole after one-sixth 
in the United States. They serve 85 percent of their time in that federal penitentiary. And in my opinion, if these individuals have shown no inclination to reform themselves, and usually because they don't cooperate with uh, law enforcement authorities, they specifically refuse to cooperate with law enforcement authorities as to indicate who their uh, co-conspirators co are, are in terms of these types of matters, uh, we consider them a risk to public safety and we choose not to bring them back. Uh, the uh, uh, Homeland Security Secretary was actually quite surprised of how lenient uh, our laws are in respect of parole and, uh, and compared it then and offered that, you know, in the United States they wouldn't get parole, for, uh, they don't get parole in the federal system. It's 85 percent you serve, and if you behave yourself, you get 15 percent off of that. Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Rathgaber? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to both ministers and to your officials for your attendance here this morning. Uh, Minister Taves, sticking with the issue of International uh, Transfer of Offenders Act, I, I recall in the last Parliament when uh, this bill was before the committee, there was some criticism regarding the uh, discretion that you as Minister would receive in uh, making decisions regarding the transfer of Canadians, uh, patriotic Canadian prisoners back to Canada, which parenthetically I, f I find ironic because other parts of this bill uh, individuals criticized because allegedly judges are losing their discretion with respect to minimum mandatory sentences, but th they seem critical of uh, vesting more discretion in the minister with respect to international transfer of offender applications. And I was hoping you could uh, uh, elucidate this committee with respect to how that discretion will be used to protect Canadians. Well, <clears throat> just on the issue of transferring prisoners, I, I note the comments of the opposition in the House saying how lenient the American system has become, uh, that, uh, that everyone now uh, uh, has uh, done away with the mandatory minimums in the, uh, in the United States and that, uh, you know, uh, that it's become a virtual panacea to become a prisoner in the United States, which is always a surprise to me given that every Canadian in an American prison wants to come home to a Canadian prison. And the reasons for that is very obvious. And, uh, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that the opposition continues to mislead Canadians about how the sentencing laws and, and the lack of parole, for example, in the United States or the mandatories that they serve, the sentencing guidelines, all of those kinds of things. We have a system that has been consistently focused on the interests of the criminal as opposed to the victims. And so what this uh, law does, in fact, is create a number of criteria. The first criteria is that of public safety. Is the transfer of that individual from the United States back to Canada in the interests of public safety? And as the minister, that is what I need to consider. I have to say that the federal courts have given the uh, Minister of Public Safety wide discretion in making that determination. A number of uh, cases have been delivered by the federal court in the last little while. Uh, some they have asked the uh, minister to reconsider, uh, and uh, I think that, uh, and I have reconsidered those, and ultimately the courts have upheld the decision that, that, uh, that I have made in those cases uh, on a reconsideration. Uh, but what this, in fact, does is give legal definition to the types of criteria that we have been applying. So in terms of the rule of law, these criteria are very important, both from an offender's point of view and from uh, a decision maker's point of view. And one of the things I, I like to stress is that if you want to cooperate with law enforcement officials, now that will be a clearly recognized criteria that you can point out and say, look, I, I identified who the ringleaders in this drug crime are or who the ringleaders are in this child pornography crime. I have identified, I have demonstrated my, uh, my willingness to be rehabilitated. But a Canadian incarcerated in a foreign prison shouldn't just be able to say, look, I demand to come back and I'm not cooperating with law enforcement uh, officials and it's none of your business whether or not uh, I'm, I'm uh, considering being rehabilitated. So this gives clear definition. It corresponds to the rule of law, which I think is, is very, very important. 
Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Taves, following up on a question from Mr. Uh, Stewart, um, I think one of the most underreported parts of, of the amendments to the Controlled Substances Act is with respect to the drug courts. And I, I, can you just clarify for me that uh, an individual who has an addiction, if he, he or she deals with that addiction, how that person will be handled under amendments to this legislation? With Again, to the drug courts? there are provisions, um, uh, as you've just um, enumerated, uh, because um, it would allow an individual, or we're, we're in cooperation, of course, with the provinces and uh, rehabilitation services, for an individual who has unfortunately become addicted and, and wants to do something about that, uh, to get enrolled in, in treatment and so that they could avoid then uh, a, criminal, a criminal offense. And so, uh, as I indicated, the bill, in terms of the penalties and uh, uh, increased penalties deals with drug traffickers. At the same time, uh, we as a government continue to support uh, the concept of drug courts, uh, which uh, again allows an individual who um, has be unfortunately become addicted, uh, not, not part of violence or cri cri uh, organized crime, that's not what we're talking about, but the unfortunate individual has become addicted to give that individual some hope to get off uh, drugs and to didn't get involved with the uh, a treatment treatment program. So it's uh, it's one of the pr provisions uh, certain that, that has my support and one that I'm very enthusiastic about. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate uh, we've run out of time, but uh, in as much as uh, a couple of questions uh, were raised uh, with respect to uh, uh, costs, I wonder if we, we could leave uh, some um, uh, some analysis with you in both official languages. Uh, I appreciate much of it's just a repeat of what we said in the spring, but nonetheless, since the issue was raised, if we could leave that with you, then thank you. Uh, it. So, and thank you very much. We'll distribute those. I want to thank the ministers and their officials for being here today, and uh, I think we are just about right on time, and uh, we need to adjourn for a few minutes.
Thank you. 